All right. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Welcome back to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. And we've embarked on a new Dharma journey uh, with a new sutra that we started last week. I went over what the sutra is called. We're just going to call it Manjushri's Pranya Sutra, Manjushri's Pranya Paramita Sutra, something to that effect. If you're curious about the title, watch part one. One of the things I'm going to start off by saying, just to kind of ease us, ease us into the talk tonight, is, you know, I was even watching parts of last week's and I was like, wow, you know, this, this sutra has a very different energy than some of our other sutras, you know, and, and a part of the reason why I love doing the Dharma doors and why I love doing all these different sutras is to get those different, the feelings of all these different sutras. And so, you know, you might've noticed last time when it was a, you know, an eight year old girl with these questions for the Buddha, it was kind of like a narrative and this sort of, it, I don't know, there was a certain feeling about it. Manjushri, right? Manjushri, our, our crown prince of the Dharma who carries the Vajra sword, you know? This is, sutra is going to have a very different energy, and that energy came across last week with like a really, uh, just an intense dive right into the teachings. <laughs> nope, not a lot of uh, foreplay, as it, you know, not a, just right to it. And you know, I don't know. I'm not saying anything's going to change tonight. We're 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 going to dive right back into it. Um, very, it's a very simple sutra, a very simple premise. Uh, Manjushri gets up and goes to where the Buddha's staying. Shariputra follows in suit, sits down. The Buddha comes out of his dwelling place. Says to Shariputra, "What are you doing?" And Shariputra, right? Shariputra's like, I don't know, Manjushri. <laughs> it was Manjushri. <laughs> he showed up. And the Buddha then says, Well, Manjushri, like, what do you, what's up? What, what's, what's going on? And Manjushri says, Oh, I came to see the Tathagata. I came to see the Buddha. I came to see the enlightened one. And the Buddha asks Manjushri, Whoa, time out, buddy. How do you do that? How do you see the Tathagata? How do you see the Buddha? How do you correctly or properly see the Tathagata? And Manjushri listed 10 characteristics, 10 qualities, 10 attributes. 10 marks, 10 signs, 10 of these lakshana, 10 qualities by which you could recognize, cognize Tathagata or the Buddha or just enlightenment. I spent all of pretty much the first class going over number one, which is that when Manjushri responds to the Buddha and says, oh, you... How, how, do I, how do I see the Tathagata? Well, I'll tell you. I see the Buddha, I see the Tathagata as having the characteristic of suchness, thusness, as it isness, Tathata. And that was all kind of the focus of last time. I'm not going to dwell too much on that particular answer but I do want to go through, because we never really finished going through all of Manjushri's uh, characteristics by which he sees the Tathagata. All right. So tonight, I was going to basically walk us through all 10 of these to make very clear the way that Manjushri sees things. Right. And again, I sort of have them enumerated here on the virtual whiteboard tonight. These 10, um, and, and this is also something I, I spent a lot of time last time talking about, that these are all, let's see, that Chinese character at the end, they are all 
qualities, lakshana. All right, so the Tathagata, the Buddha, and, and I don't think I have to say this really, right? Because I know this is like class two, but I just want to make very clear, right, is that when we talk about the Tathagata, when we talk about the Buddha, I'm not really talking about a person, right, necessarily. We're not really talking about the historical Buddha and what he looked like, right? Did he have a top knot? Did he have an Ushnisha? Did he have long earlobes? We're not really talking about that Buddha. We're sort of talking about enlightenment. Maybe we're talking about an enlightened person. Maybe we're talking about enlightenment itself, but we're talking about like, how do you conceive of, how does one, you know, the, the language that I kind of often use is touch. How, how does one touch that? How do, you, how do you come into contact with enlightenment? Like, what does it look like? What does it smell like? What does it taste like? And so Manjushri is talking about how you could understand enlightenment and, or the Tathagata or the Buddha. And so these 10 criteria are that the Buddha is, has the characteristics of tapata, suchness. And if this wasn't clear last week, you know, I spent, I really tried to bring us to this presence, to this, this that's happening here. This, this like a, a, a virtual Zoom streaming call, you know, whatever, you, you know, this laptop, all of these things. The idea of suchness is that this, this is not, not enlightenment. Like this is kind of it. It's here, it's right here. It's not, it's not like up there where you can't see it or down there. It's like, it is here, but it's not this. It's not, it's not this per se. And so that subtle kind of subtle dance where it's, it's, it's this, but it's not this. <laughs> That's sort of a subtle dance about Tathata, so the Tathagata, the Buddha, is, quali or is qualified by or understood by, by being this, sort of. The second one is qualified by non-distinction. We spent some time on that last week too, not distinguishing this from that. So if you wanted to touch Tathagata, the Buddha, if you wanted to understand enlightenment, it wouldn't be about this or that. It would need to, in a certain sense, be the totality of it all, but you wouldn't even want to stop there, really. You would really want to keep going with that idea because you wouldn't want to distinguish any, you wouldn't want to leave anything out, right? And so that idea of not distinguishing, not cutting it up into two, not cutting the Buddha up into two, right? That's the meaning of that second one, that the Buddha that Manjushri sees the Buddha with the characteristic of non-discrimination or non-distinction. Interesting. Number three was immobility, not being able to move from here to there, which also I spoke about last time as being part of this, um, the idea of the totality of all of this. And so there's nowhere to go, <laughs> no, no mobility in that way. And then that was sort of tied up into this idea of no action, no, the Tathagata doesn't do anything, doesn't say anything, doesn't think anything. There is no movement, there is no doing. We, confused sentient beings, do, we do things. We produce karma, we produce anxiety, we produce all of those, that's all of our world, that's called samsara. Tathagata is without action. And that's pretty deep. You could think of that again as karma producing, not, not producing karma, but also just on that plane that we were talking about of uh, nowhere to go because it's the totality. It's the whole thing. So nowhere to go and nothing to do in that sense. 
All right. Yeah, Katie, let's talk. Sorry, I wasn't here last week. <laughs> okay, um, a few people probably were. So could you kind of map immobility and non-action onto space and time? Yeah, let's let's do that one. That's a great analogy. So time is interesting, of course, right? And especially if you know about time zones, right? And the idea of like it being a specific time here because the, the sun is here, and then it's that time here because it's, you know, and the, the idea of this sort of progression of the time zones. Well, that's useful if you're a finite being in space that you are only on the west coast but does time in that sense that we were just talking about time zone time does that make any sense if if you are the united states if you were the whole united states would there be different times or would you perhaps need a different framework in which the sun is not located over just where I am, but the sun is over the United States. So there's sort of a different conception of time altogether, actually, because your reference of space is different. So yeah, Katie, space, time mo versus mobility and action and all of that. And so it's in that idea of like, if you were the monolith of the entire United States, then time would be different. And if you're following me, which I think you are, that idea of, oh, well then what if it's the earth? Or what if it's the universe? Or then what if it's the totality of all existence? There would kind of be only one time or arguably no time. And that would probably just be splitting hairs at that macro level. I'm going to use Katie's question to, to bring us sort of down to a certain level of what we're trying to talk about, because this is already, you know, Mandrew Shree's, oh, it's crazy. So this has already gotten a little out of hand. So I want to tone it, tone it down. I want to bring it down a few notches. If you were to say, I don't know, try to do some sort of sati, mindfulness, focused awareness of tapagata. Let's say you wanted to do that and you were like, okay, great. I know about a candle flame, the fire, the movement. I know what I'm looking at and I'm focused on it. And if I were looking over here, I wouldn't be focused on the the candle flame. I'd be focused not on the candle flame. What if I wanted to focus my attention and my awareness on Tathagata, this profound idea of like enlightened awareness or something like the, that? What if I wanted to focus on that, Manjushri? What what would I what would I <laughs> what? <laughs> like what? What 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 what? what? And so Manju Shri's answer is, here's what you would want to try, or actually not try, but here's what you would think about, contemplate. That, which is inconceivable, just for example, and that's not one of our lists, but I'm trying to get us in a mood, that the idea is, is that I can see my green shirt. I can see the whiteboard. I can see all these things. They are very distinguishable. The whiteboard is distinguishable from the guy in front of the whiteboard. So uh, this is definitely not Tathagata. That's not Tathagata because those are distinguished. So anything distinguished, dis discriminated or separated, that's definitely not enlightenment. That's definitely not Tathagata. Because Tathagata, you could, you could conceive of it by conceiving of that which is not distinguished. Yeah, and if you're sitting there going like, what? You're on the right track. Honestly, if you're sitting there going like, well, but what would that mean to focus my attention on the non-distinguished? What would that 
look like, feel like, or be like. If that's you right now, then you're on the right track. If you're like, oh yeah, I got that, then you might not be on the right track. <laughs> because if you've said, I got that, then you've, you've distinguished it. <laughs> Surprise! <laughs> so the idea is like a, all 10 of these are working against the way perception works. <laughs> perception works by distinguishing this from that. A lot of distinguishing this from that has to do with movement or non-movement, action, non-action, things like that. So if again, we're trying, Mandrushree is trying to put our mind in the right place of how to conceive of or see, using the language of the sutra, how to see Tathagata. See it as suchness, see it as non-distinguished, immobile, and without movement without action. And now number five, you, the Tathagata can be understood, conceived of, or viewed as having the characteristics of neither arising nor ceasing, neither coming into being nor going out of being. So you're telling me that there was never a time there's never a time that there wasn't Tathagata, something to that effect, something to that effect, which is to say that there was a time that I, I wasn't, and then I was born and I, ro I rose into the world. And by my conception, I've been in the world now for a bit. And as I understand it, I'm going to go out of the world, <laughs> arising, ceasing. This is the great teaching of the Buddha, of course, that all things arise and cease. Pleasure and pain arise, all things arising and ceasing, arising and ceasing. Uh, everything, everything. But Manjushri just said, if you want to understand, or the way that he sees, understands Tathagata, is it's that which neither arises nor ceases. has no birth or death, no production or destruction. Okay, right? The, the language of neither arising nor ceasing should be very familiar to sutra heads, to dharma heads around, right? And I talked a little bit about neither arising nor ceasing last week, right? Questions, ideas about where we're at? We're at number five. Yeah. Okay. So, Manjushri's next criteria is so, by the way, by the way, if, 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 if like you were like, oh, neither arising nor ceasing. So, like, immortal, right? Like, always and forever, right? Well, the next criteria, the next quality is that Tathagata, the Buddha enlightenment, has the quality or characteristic of neither existing nor not existing. And that's pretty much where we left it last time. I never, I didn't really get to speak about this idea of neither existing nor not existing. And so everything up to this point is just sort of like review. There's a, there's a buildup, of course, going on with these ideas. And like I said, neither arising nor ceasing, you might think, oh, well then just always and forever. Right, like God, yeah? Oh, Tathagata, the Buddha's God then, right? Tathagata, from, from the beginning to the end. Alpha and Omega, the whole nine, right? So that's, that's it, right? No, because of the next one, which is that a certain quality, a certain characteristic by which you could conceive of, touch, understand the Buddha, Tathagata, enlightenment, is that it, it, he, she, whatever, neither exists nor doesn't exist. 
but wait a minute. I, I, as far as I understand everything, I exist. The whiteboard exists. Uh, this, this apple does not exist. Doesn't exist. Doesn't, it's not there. It's not there. It doesn't exist. I exist. Whiteboard exists. The apple does not exist, right? Things uh, from the past don't exist, things from the future exist, but this exists. Wait a minute, Manjushri. You just said that the Tathagata neither exists nor doesn't exist. I don't believe I'm familiar with how to think of that. How, wait, 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 wait. Because I'm kind of in the mode of thinking that things either exist or they don't exist. That's kind of how my mind works. And things that exist, I can talk to, I can grab, I can hold, I can think of, I can, you know, things that don't exist, they don't exist. What is this, what is this third category that you've dropped on me? This, that it neither exists nor doesn't exist. Because I kind of need it, I need it to fit in one of those categories. Well, that's kind of again what I'm saying, or what Manjushri is suggesting is that if you would like to conceive of or touch, understand enlightenment, Tathagata, the Buddha, it, he, she, neither is an existent nor a non existent. <clears throat> Any ideas about how something could possibly neither exist nor not exist? <laughs> Michael, I tell us, enlighten us now. No, I don't. I don't know, but <laughs> you do though. <know. laughs> well, what I'm noticing. And I honestly can't remember if I said this last week, I was thinking about it, but was it these seem to point us to that we're not on the right track. Like if I'm like sitting here and I'm like, ah, oh, I think I got it. I think I know what the Tathagata is. And then I'm like, wait, but this thing I think I know exists or moves or whatever it is, oh, that must not be it. So I need to search a little further or something, something along those lines. It's like pointing away from it rather than pointing to it. We're pointing <clears throat> to what's away from it or something. This is definitely working in a kind of negative space kind of a way, for sure. But that gets tricky, of course, instantly, because then we're in kind of a dualistic realm of positive space and negative space. And so, you know, the, these sutras and these ideas, I, I, say, I say this all the time, you know, these are not easily understood. They're, they're very, very not easily explained in that way. And they, they're, Insofar as it's kind of a negative space, it's kind of a negative space in terms of our conditioning, in terms of the way we are conditioned to think in a very dualistic, polaristic, it, does it exist or does it not exist? Because if it exists, then now we're talking. If it doesn't exist, then that's fantasy land, and, and I don't need to be bothering with that. Like what, what comes to my mind, which is, I don't think it's correct in, in that context, but what it comes to my mind is when I think about the, it's a little bit further away, but about the phenomena world, right? And we think about a book, right? We had this example so many times, right? Does the book exist or it does not exist? Yes, it exists because there's an agreement to a book, but it doesn't not inherent. There's no inherent book. There's no such thing as a book, but there is a book. But it has it has nothing to do the sentence with this phenomenal world, but it's that's what comes to my mind. Yeah. And that's exactly right, Connie. 
that's exactly right. The idea of existence or non-existence, as, as far as I understand it, is very much how Connie understands it, understands it which is the, the world that I might think I'm moving in, which is the world of existence, things that exist, and things that don't exist. Very clear divide between the two. That might not be actually what's going on. And what might be going on is a much more sort of dreamlike, illusory reality of dependently originated, agreed upon conventional phenomena that sort of conventionally exist, but in no way sort of concretely exist like I think they do. That is sort of, and, and if I may, I would like to, to you know, make it clear that this is, this is a very special application of the idea or the doctrine of the middle path or the middle way. And I've said this before that in the early days of Buddhism, the middle path was sort of like, you know, a middle path between fasting and gorging yourself in an all-you-can-eat buffet. How about one meal a day? So you're, you're not going so far as to starve yourself, but you're not going so far as to gorge yourself. Just, the, you know, right in the middle there, right? Uh, a lot of uh, Indian yogis and ascetics would go around naked. That was it. It was like if you were renouncing, then you got to become a you know, your animal self and just be, be you, you know, birthday suit and all. And then there's princes and kings and queens that are, you know, draped in silk. The Buddha said, well, rather than going naked or draped in silk, let's go some middle path where we basically just kind of wear the same thing every day. And it's these kind of three ragged robes, enough to keep you warm, but not enough to make you envious and prideful. That's a middle path. And this goes on and on and on, this wisdom of like that, that middle path between extremes. But then at a certain point, that wisdom, that great wisdom of the middle path gets applied to even reality and this realization that thinking that things exist or they don't exist is a rather sharp divide that creates a false sense of reality or a false dualism. And that actually, there's kind of this ontological, pardon the big term, but an ontological middle path between existence and non-existence. Connie spoke about what that might mean. I elaborated on what that might mean, but I actually think it's a little dangerous to even suggest what it might mean. What I, what I mean is, is that it's kind of a practice to stay in the middle and kind of keep existence and non-existence understood, so to speak but to not really get to like, you know, we have a tendency to favor existence. If you go down to the used car lot and the guy's like, so I got this car over here that exists and it's $1,500 and I got this car over here that doesn't exist and it's 3,000. Which one, which one do you want? The one that exists or one that doesn't exist, right? We're, we're kind of like, I'll take the one that exists, thank you. We don't mess around with non-existence, right? So when one is walking the middle, the ontological middle path here, you don't want to get too comfy. You don't want to get too comfortable in thinking that that is, you know, existent or non-existent. You're kind of, you're kind of walking at an ontological tightrope now. So, no, so that's the idea of that neither existent nor non-existent. I don't believe that that is a categorical statement about the Tathagata, 
so much as that it's a statement about how we view reality at, in terms of existence or non-existence. Everybody good on with that? I mean, it's pretty basic, right? <laughs> Pretty basic stuff, really. <laughs> okay, so because we got we got places to go, so now we know this tathagataness, right, is neither existent nor non-existent, or at least, actually, I need to constantly say this. I I, I really want to be a broken record here. It's not that the Tathagata, enlightenment, the Buddha. It's not that Tathagata ex doesn't exist or, or not exists. It has the characteristics or qualities, the lakshana of neither existing nor non existent. I'm a stickler for the language. It's why I wrote all this on the board. It's, 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 the language here is very clear that they're talking about these qualities or characteristics by which one can touch, understand Tathagata. These are not sort of, again, ontological categorical statements about the Buddha or the Tathagata. It's actually much more about qualities and characteristics. That's, it's a very, very subtle distinction to make, but I make it nonetheless. Okay, the next one for this neither existing nor non-existing, immobile, un undoing, right, suchness and undistinguished suchness, right? The next quality or characteristic of it is being located neither in some place nor elsewhere. And this is actually sort of what I alluded to earlier about how it's tathagata suchness tathata. It's not it's not this, but it's not not this. That is akin to the this this uh, number. Uh, what are we on number seven and six? This is akin to that. It's. Tathagata is not located in some place, neither not located, right? Characterized, having the quality of being located neither in some place nor elsewhere. Again, if your mind is a little like, whoa, wait, what? then you're on the right track because this is supposed to be pushing you out of how you would normally think about something, <laughs> right? Like if I were to tell you that I have something down here, a surprise for you, I've got a surprise for you down here. And you're like, ooh, what is it? What does it look like? What does it smell like? What does it taste like? What does it feel like? What are the characteristics and qualities by which I could distinguish what it is? If, if you were like, what is that? And I was like, well, it's not, it's neither existent nor non-existent, right? And it's not <laughs> located anywhere, nor is it not located. In <laughs> that, that would be like, what are you talking about? Yes, exactly. <laughs> and again, because normally things that we think of are located somewhere. <laughs> it's a part of reality, <laughs> right? That they're, and and it's, loca it's location can be like, you know, really wild and, and weird, like in my mind or in the past or in the future, <laughs> like, you know, these, these locations can be rather uh, ephemeral and, and all of that. But I definitely think of something as have, have being somewhere. Tathagata, the Buddha, right? I, I want to try to rephrase Manjushri the way Manjushri says it. So, I contemplate the Tathagata as characterized by being located neither in some place nor elsewhere. And by the like that that idea of like or elsewhere is like if I told you 
the Tathagata is not located anywhere, and so you thought you were really clever <laughs> and knew where the Tathagata was, not there either. <laughs> <laughs> it's not locatable. <laughs> no GPS system can find the Tathagata, I promise you. <laughs> and I really do hope that you're like, well, obviously, obviously not located or not located somewhere because it's sort of characterized by suchness and non distinction right <laughs> so if you were like obviously because if it's not it's not distinguished how could it be located somewhere now you're on the right now you got it you know michael what comes to my mind is um Tilke Kienze, you know talked a lot about the last not this reincarnation the last one i don't know which one is he has a lot of like uh texts and teachings around um he like rainbows the quality of a rainbow right like and i think that reminds me of like neither neither existing nor not existing rising not existing located and time is like because a rainbow it's so funny with a rainbow right like even like depending on where i am i see a rainbow or not depending what time like it does exist and it does not not exist right obviously it's perception right so it's very physical um, based, but I, I like this, uh, um, how do you call it? Um, not, uh, not analogy, but, um, mm -hmm. is it an analogy? I don't know. Like a simile. You know, yeah. But you, but you know what I'm saying? Like a little a bit with the rain, the quality of a rainbow. I do. And, and it's funny because a simile came to my mind a while ago. And it was one of those ones where I was like, Oh, just going to have to let that one go. But I, I will, I'll go grab it because it's apropos to your rainbow. There is, in many, many sutras, the Buddha talks about a person who has a cataract or some defect of the eye so that when they look at a light, they see these rainbow-colored flowers these kind of, uh, you know, things, you know, and we probably, you might have had this in the morning. If you wake up in the morning, your eyes got some crust or whatever, and around the uh, lights, it's a, like a halo or a ring or something like that. Very much like a rainbow. The Buddha describes these, these uh, rainbow-colored flowers that a man or a person with a bad eye would see. Now, the person next to them who has clear eyes, they look up at the light, they don't see the rainbow colored flowers. So now the, the kind of the meditation or the analogy is sort of about those rainbow colored flowers and whether they exist or they don't exist. Yeah. Mm. Now, of course, to the, to the other person with clear eyes, they do not exist. And if the other person with the cataract was like, yo, check out those flowers, yo, the other person would be like, what flowers? Mm. They don't exist. The person with the, the cataract would be like, yes, they do exist. Mm. We've already touched on uh, the existence, non-existence, which speaks of the nature of these flowers, that they, they don't exist, but they don't not exist. And of course, what we're talking about is the true or, you know, real nature of things, which is that the, the flower exists as a dependently originated phenomena that emerges and arises because of the cataract and because of the light. Because if you remember, or if you think of the analogy, if you turn the light off, the flowers go away. So they are not arisen or derived from the cataract. And they are definitely not real because as soon as the light goes away, they go away. 
And of course, the person with the clear eyes, they, he, he, she, they knew it, the flowers don't exist at all. But, but wait, is that person right? Is the person with the clear eyes right that the flowers don't exist? Well, that's a view that might be wrong. And the view that the person has that they do exist might be wrong. But the view where they exist in a kind of dependently originated way, dependent on both the eye and the light, and they arise in the in-between and are a phenomena, but ultimately empty, shall we say? That's what we're talking about. That's actually very close to Tathagata, by the way. And how it is that this <laughs> is not the Tathagata, but the Tathagata is not other than this, because this is a dependently originated cataract flower. I'm a dependently originated cataract flower. And I know that that's a little like heavy, it's a little early for such a heavy statement as that, but that is the very idea of Pratitya Samutpata, or dependent origination, as it's called, in Buddhism. That all of this visual, auditory, olfactory, gustatory, and tactile mental phenomena are emerging like cataract flowers. And everything actually has the nature of not existing like you think it does, but not not existing. And it's in that way that this is tathata. This is suchness. This is it. <laughs> and there it goes. <laughs> Questions, answers, comments, ideas about that. So, oh, by the way, I, wanted, I did want to mention too, the cataract flower, the, remember the, the, when I first started that analogy and the person had the, they were seeing the flowers? Where are those flowers? Are they in the air? The, the ties to number seven again, neither located nor not located, right? Mm. That's what I was doing. I was trying to like, to, to, if you were there, if you were like, oh, wow, oh, wow. Everything's a dependently originated cataract flower. If you were there, and then I dropped on you this idea of like, well, where does that flower exist? And you were like, whoa, that's weird. Because it would look like it, it is floating in the air, but it's not. It looks like this, this yeah, it look, yeah. It looks like this is located in front of you. I know, it looks like that to me too. But the idea is, is that it's all again, like a dependently originated cataract flower where even location is a trick. Yeah. Well, even you could even go s even further and something say like, um, if you talk, um, if we would be in, in a room together and you tell me something about the picture I'm not aware of, then the picture is or the painting, sorry, on the wall. I'm looking at the painting on the wall. So there is a location of a paint, as so there is a place of a painting. So there is a painting and the place of the painting. But if you don't point out the painting, and I'm not aware of the painting because I'm no, not looking at it or I haven't noticed it, then there is no pa painting either. Depend. So it's also depending on my, you know, on on my consciousness and perception. No. I got yeah, it. I'm getting lost a bit. It's, yeah. I'm going to go further. You wanted to go further, so we got to go further. Because the idea is, I mean, my, my virtual whiteboard here is perfect for tonight, right? Because the idea is that usually, usually my whiteboard is located on the wall behind me. Is this located on the wall behind me? Well, it sort of kind of is, and it sort of kind of isn't, because it's actually being generated by the Zoom virtual background thing, and it has nothing to do with behind me in that way. So there's a lot of funny, you know, a lot of funny games that could be played about between virtual reality and 
independently originated cataract flowers. But even if we're not virtual, Connie, even if we were back at SFDC and I was there in front of you, right? And I was on the little dais, Buddha behind me, you know, even then, if I were to point at that giant, remember the giant whiteboard on the wheels? Mm -hmm. If I were to point at that and say, where is that? And everybody pointed and said, in the back of the room behind you, that would be like saying, and the, and the flowers are in the air in front of me. Rather than realizing that it's a dependently originated, ultimately mind, mind phenomena, and part of the mind phenomena is that it appears floating in the air in front of me. Well, part of the mind phenomena is that I appear speaking in front of you, in front of a whiteboard, mm -hmm. in exactly the same way. Exactly the same way. Insofar as you are like, oh, wow, that's crazy that that's true. That's tathata. -ta. And insofar as you're like, nope, I'm still geospatially located in space and time, and I don't know what you're saying, then that ain't tata. -ta -ta. <laughs> okay. Let's, I think it'd be cool to get through the whole list tonight, you know, so I'm going to move ahead. At any point, you know, you pull the brakes. So now this neither existing nor non-existing, like a dependently originated cataract flower, that is not located, is located neither somewhere nor not, also like a dependently originated cataract flower, right? This tathagata, Manjushri says, I contemplate the tathagata as characterized by no, being by being neither in the past, present, or future in the three phases of time, nor otherwise. So the Tathagata is not in the past, present, or future, nor otherwise. So this is going to be like the location thing where when I tell you the Tathagata isn't here, isn't located, you don't get to go, oh, great, it's over here, bye. You don't get to do that, because I just told, no, 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 it's not located in that way. So you, you, you're sort of left with this, but if you're still locating things, then you, you, you're missing it, right? That's the subtle difference in ignorance and delusion, right, where it's kind of oddly the same thing. Well, similarly, we're not dealing with space, and not, not a Akasha space. We're not dealing with geolocatability. Now we're dealing with time. The text in classic Buddhist fashion speaks of the three phases, which is, if you are not familiar with it, the past, the present, and the future. I kind of spent a lot of time last week talking about the present, and it's sort of relative dependency on ideas of the past and ideas of the future. So if you were here, that'll all be relevant to what's about to sort of be said in that way. There's an interesting, um, well, all of these are related. All of these are the same phenomena in a sense spatial distinctions of being located here and not there, right? Distinguishing. Well, you know, these are going, as these go down, they get a little more profound, a little more profound. And this one is saying something to the effect that what we think of as the present vis-a-vis -vis the past and the future are also like a dependently originated cataract flower in terms of, if you go back to existence or non-existence, and you think of the, the, the cataract flower, and you're like, oh, wow, that's weird, because it doesn't exist, but it doesn't not exist. And you're, and you're into that kind of toggling between existence and non-existence. Well, do the same thing when it comes to thinking of something as being 
like now, remember earlier? Remember later? Remember? Remember an hour from now? Right? The idea is, is that in the same, and this is, by the way, this is like, not, it, it gets crazier and crazier, but this is pretty crazy. The idea is, is that in that same way that you mistakenly, deludedly, ignorantly think that the cataract flower is out there, and you're like, oh, why can't I, you know, it's out there. It looks like it's out there. It looks like it exists out there. The to, in, in so far as we're talking about Tathagata, Buddhism has the same approach to time, where this, this thing that we think of as presence, like the present moment, what's, what's happening now, real time. It's very similar to locating something in space, but being wrong about that. If you know what I mean. How it, that cataract flower could look like it's out there, but it's actually not out there, but it looks like that. In the same way, this could look like it's happening now. They have that appearance. Hold on. Okay, yeah. So here's this this is a this is a beautiful, beautiful, subtle teaching. When we're talking about lakshana, characteristics, qualities, attributes, signs, marks, right? When we're talking about qualities, you could think of something like color, right? I got my nice chartreuse shirt on tonight, right? This kind of really lime green. It, the lime green is a quality of my shirt. It's a lakshana, right? And it's they got long, big colors. That's a lakshana. That's a quality of it. If it had no collar and it was a blue shirt or a red shirt, that, it would be a different shirt. <laughs> what makes this one this one is it has these qualities, right? So there's a way that qualities are like color, shape, size, but also their smell and sound if something's loud, quiet, right? All, you know, I, I often use the example of like, how do you know it's a dog barking? Well, it has the qualities of a dog. If it was like, meow, meow, and, and somebody was like, wow, that dog's really loud, you'd be like, what? That's that, meows are the quality of a cat. That's how I know it's a cat. So these qualities are very subtle, color, sound, shape, all of that, right? Well, if you're with me on this idea of like the qualities of things, but if you're with the idea of a dependently originated cataract flower, let's say it's a chartreuse, a, a green, lime green, dependently originated cataract flower, Is it really, is it really chartreuse? Is it really green? I mean, if it doesn't even exist, how can you really fathom the color of it? So you're telling me that the color of something is sort of akin to its existence or non-existence, that it sort of appears to be existing, but not, might not be existing in the way that I think it is. It might have the color that I think it does. I go through this like kind of digression about lakshana, color, shape, sound, because this whole, this whole thing we've been talking about is about these lakshana, these qualities or characteristics. And maybe it's, maybe it's something I haven't explicitly said yet, so I should probably explicitly say this, right? All these lakshana, color, shape, size, time, space, all these things, all lakshana 
are equally lakshanic. They're very, they're all functioning the same way, which is actually based on distinction or discrimination of various shades of color, various uh, sound waves, various, all kinds of things. It's all a kind of distinction game. But what the Dharma is here, what the teaching is here, is that even though the lakshana of big, something big, and the lakshana of tiny, even those, those, those seem very serious, like something big is something big and something little is something little. The idea is all the lakshana, whether they're color or sound or time or space, they're all equal. They all have the same origin, actually. And when you kind of touch or tap into the equal origin, equal nature, equal origin of all lakshana, that's, that starts to get very interesting very quickly. When you start to put all lakshana on the same table, even though you might be talking about color and time, so what I'm getting at is that you might think that this is a chartreuse shirt, long collar, and that it exists now. And the nowness of it, the existence of it, the color, all of it is sort of, none of that has priority, is what I kind of would like to say in some technical way. We would like to think that the existence has priority over the color or the time has priority over the all the but the idea is is that what we think something is is a uh, is a laksha a little lakshana house of cards and it includes its shape size color number whether it's moving or not whether it's located here or there and certainly whether it was yesterday today or tomorrow. Because if you want to sell me yesterday's car today, right? I'm, I'm going I'm to want today, I want the real existing car today. All right, Robert was, Robert was hot on, on a question. Or not, he's like, I'm out of here. Oh no no no! Uh, I I was doing the uh, the ABCs. Um, sorry, I wasn't really asking a question. But oh, thank I you. thought okay. Oh. <laughs> Katie, though, maybe some anybody. Hey, it's Snowy just, here. Okay, oh. no, you go ahead. Oh, thank, uh, thank you. That's you know, uh, eternity has nothing to do with time or space. I love that line from uh, Joseph Campbell. Just wanted to share that. That's, that's along the lines we're talking about. Katie, you had a thing, insight? I was just thinking Lakshana is like metadata tags, but on nothing, like on metadata tags on emptiness. And in, this, in the way that all metadata tags are metadata tags. And it's not like one's cooler than the other, or one's like, it's, it's like they're all, of the same one, op open close one and zero kind of thing exactly but it's it's one of those things though you know again i present this as a very heavy meditation which it's like it's one thing to be saying these things and it's another thing to really sit and 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 realize that that ah this is a that I think something is existing presently is just kind of a lakshanic quality of it. In the same way that I think it's green, I think it's here. It's to put those on an equal level and to really sit with that is heavy. It's heavy, you know, it's heavy. <laughs> Let's get through a few more. Why not? Why not get heavier? This is this is where we really we go we we go like all is a what so Manjushri tells us after all of that that he contemplates the Tathagata as characterized by 
being neither dualistic nor non-dualistic. And it is a sentence like that, is a sentiment, a statement like that, that I often will say that Buddhism is way beyond non-dualism. And what I mean by that is, again, like if this is your first time here, <laughs> we're talking about duality, the subject-object relationship. The subject-object relationship is deep. <laughs> it's really deep. And, you know, your, our whole worlds are predicated on the, the person and then the, the stuff subject object and that's the dualism and you know for thousands of years many 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 thousands of years humankind has been tripping out on a certain state of being that could be characterized as non-dual not subject object oriented not me and it, but a unified oneness, a wholeness. You know, what Freud described as the oceanic feeling. He had this great term, the oceanic feeling. And it's the idea of not being inside or outside, and in a sense, being the totality of all existence, a kind of oneness. So that would be non dualistic. Manjushri just said that he contemplates the Thagata as being neither dualistic nor non-dualistic. Now I know, I know the Dharma heads in the room, and you've already said it. You already realized it. You were like, yeah, because to set up an opposition of non-dualistic and dualistic is dualistic. How are you gonna get away with that? How are you gonna get away with walking around talking about non-duality? So then the Buddha or Manjushri applies again that, that middle path, the wisdom of the middle path to, to that very idea, right? The, the very idea of duality and non-duality. Manjushri says, yeah, not even that. And, it, and, and, and certainly at this point in the list, if, 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 you're, if you're ready to give up, if you're ready to be like, this Tathagata sounds utterly inconceivable. It's uh, like uh, if you're there, then you're 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 basically one step away from enlightenment. And what I mean by that, I I always joke, but what I mean by that though, you know, is that this teaching is about has always been about since day one. This teaching has always been about clinging grasping, holding on, and then suffering as a result of that, clinging and holding on. And this is actually just taking that idea all the way to the very way in which our minds work, which is that we desperately seek grounding. We desperately seek that firm ground of existence or non-existence, present, past, future, Whatever it is, we desperately seek that. And this practice or this teaching is about not doing that, not clinging or, or, or resting on, oh, finally, Tathagata, like a warm blanket. I'm, I'm good. I can rest. No, the idea is that this is a practice of overcoming clinging and attachment, even to such subtle concepts as existence, non-existence, time, and then certainly duality or non-duality. 
questions, comments, ideas about non-duality or duality or the middle path between those two. Sweet. And number 10. Uh, Michael. Sweet. Question. Um, the wording of this last one, number nine, it talks about dualistic or non-dualistic. I would like it if it were dual or non-dual. Hmm. Uh, but the dualistic to me is a little bit problematic because I think of dualistic as being a way of thinking as opposed to dual and non-dual is a, re a type of reality. Mm. Uh, it, 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 am I just reading too much into the semantics of this? Or um, maybe, I, maybe these are all dual, dualist, du duality, they're all the same thing. It's maybe, I don't know. Um, I just wanted to bring that up, I guess. Yeah, and I think, I mean, yeah, and the, you know, I was trying to get out of the way of the, the Chinese characters, which is without the characteristics, the, the lakshana of being two. That's the Chinese is very simple, actually. It's, it's without the characteristic quality of being two and without the characteristic of not. Not being two, okay. And the language of neither dualistic nor non-dualistic, I think, is accurate and appropriate. Or, but with your caveat, which is the semantic caveat, which is the semantics are not very important here. What's what's important here is. Oh, okay. Oh, oh, oh. Thanks, thanks, Dean. This is sweet. What's important is. When, you know, I, I started this Dharma talk, or at least at the, the top of it, with this idea that Tathagata, it's not, it's not this, but it's not not this. Like that idea, mm -hmm. right? Well, this, the dualistic one is sort of along those lines. And what I mean is, is that for me, the real heart of this message is that the Buddha, the Tathagata, the enlightened one, it's, it's kind of, it's not you, Dean, but it's not not you. That's the important message of the dualism and not dualistic, because dualistic means I'm a little human being born on earth, and I've heard about this great person, the Buddha, and, I, and that's one person, and I'm one person, and I could be like that one person. When Manjushri says, I contemplate the Tathagata as being not dualistic, he's saying, I don't view the Tathagata as being other. But then the other flip side, though, is that it's also like not just you in that way. Yeah, I, I think that maybe what was the message to me with the prior numbers is the message of non non dualistic thinking and so to me this still feels like it, it, it all is encompassed in non dualistic thinking which is to be sort of doubtful about your perceptions of duality um all, to always be sort of doubtful about is it really separate? Is it really separate? And so, it, but it, to me, it all kind of fits in the concept of uh, non-dualistic thinking. And so, it, maybe oh, that's Junior, that's it. That's it. You're you nailed it. It's exactly right. And what I mean is, is that up until this point, number one through eight have been about the non-dualistic nature of the Tathagata. And then with this one, Manjushri said, oh yeah, and by the way, not even not dualistic. 
because you might have gotten too comfortable in non-duality land. And that's, again, yeah. the message of, of the middle path is that you never rest. You never say, oh, I found the middle path, everybody. It's over here. Because mm -hmm. the middle, the actual middle path doesn't work like that. Right? It's not a, it's not a way kind of an idea. And so I love your, your, your inquiry, Dean. I really do because you, you're, you're, you're doing it. You're, that's the point. All of these up until this point have been about like, yeah, it's not dualistic. And then not even that. And, you, and again, you're supposed to be left like, well, <laughs> how, I mean, I really don't know how to conceive of not dualistic, but not, not dualistic. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, number 10. Manager Sri says, I contemplate the Tathagata as characterized by being neither, by having, sorry, by having neither purity nor impurity. Mm, it could also just be by being neither pure nor impure. This might sound like a little too simple to be number 10. It might sound a little too simplistic, like it should be further up the chain because it's a kind of a little too dualistic in that way. But I, I, there's a deeper significance to number 10. When a sutra like this says pure and impure, they're kind of talking about wholesome and unwholesome roots. To, to use Buddhist language, the cultivation of wholesome roots and the non-cultivation or not to cultivate, cultivating harmful or non-beneficial roots. Do good, avoid evil is like the classic formula for this. And of course the Dharma or Buddhism was, I mean, that's like how you do it, the wholesome Dharma. Buddhism is like the most wholesome dharma you could find. It's so wholesome, right? What the idea of number 10 is, is yes, at a very basic level, this is suggesting or saying that deeming, deeming these uh, you know, non-existent, not temporally existent things that go through the list, but deeming this as pure or impure, defiled, undefiled, beneficial, unbeneficial, harmful, unharmful, or harmful, beneficial, deeming things in that way. Number 10, Madhu Sri says, well, if I want to contemplate the Tathagata, I'm definitely not thinking in terms of pure and impure. And again, at the very basic level, that would kind of be like, well, that's a very good bodhisattva move. That's a good bodhisattva move to not judge things as good or bad or beautiful or ugly, to be equanimous. The Buddha taught us upeksha, equanimity. That's what we're trying to be is equanimous. Yeah, that's right. What number 10 is, is, is secretly kind of about, it's about the mind that would want to say, well, this Buddhism stuff is great. And that other stuff is terrible. Anything, you know, um, well, I don't know. I don't know what, I don't want to get political or whatever, but like name your political ideology. And the idea is like, oh, that political ideology is really defiled. It's really impure. It'll really mess your mind up. But Buddhism is so great. And this number 10 is Manjushri saying, I contemplate the Tathagata as being characterized by being not great or not great, neither pure nor impure, not super or not super. That's how I contemplate the, the, the Tathagata. 
So again, yeah, at a basic level, this is about a non-judgmental mind that would put things in categories, but it's even deeper because it's kind of saying that, yeah, and if you started to get excited about how that might be the move, ooh, the middle path, the middle path's dope. No, no, the middle path is not dope. It's not actually. It's not fresh. It's, it's like, that's the idea. It's neither stale or fresh. It's neither cool or lame, actually. <laughs> Questions, answers, comments, and ideas about the Tathagata being characterized as not having the, the qualities of purity and impurity. Is it neither fly nor not fly? Definitely. Just to clarify. Okay, just check. Definitely. Out. Yeah, because if you thought that the Buddha was fly, yeah. But if you thought the Buddha was not fly, you're definitely missing out. I think what is so beautiful when you go through these 10, um, 10 understandings is that you at some point you get deeper and deeper and then you're like, you know, at some point, you know, with some people at number three, some people at 10, whatever, you then, I feel like everybody's like, okay, whatever. You know, it's like you give, you really in this moment, you give away all your concepts of everything because it's, because yeah, I think this is kind of a natural impulse that we have, right? So, because there's this really this deep sense of like, okay, my mind, just can't grasp it and i can't figure it out with my mind because it's beyond mind or i don't even want to put it in language and i think this is what i don't know what what comes up that you just throw all your concepts and ideas just overboard and just surrender and open to what is experienced in that moment so i think that's exactly this, this has, and it, I sort of went off on this, Connie, that was a great comment. I, I sort of, in my, own, in my own words, sort of was trying to say that earlier, which is like this idea that this is speaking more about our minds and the way our minds work and the way our minds miss the Tathagata. It's speaking more about that than it is speaking positively about the Tathagata, how to see the Tathagata and all of that. This is very operating in that, I guess what I call the negative space of what Connie called the surrendering of our concepts in that way. So again, beautiful comment, Connie. That's very much the idea. And I keep wanting to come back to what I think what is really, 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 really special and significant about this which is this idea that like, it's here. It's like, it's in this, it's here. It's again, it's not on a mountaintop. Um, in particular, I would suggest it's not with your eyes closed in that sense. Like it's, it's this, but again, it's not this. And that's what's sort of wonderful and special about it in that way. That it is this, right? I have a very last comment and then I shut up. My question is, I think in general, and I want to bring it in a little bit what we've discussed into the human experience, right? Like to make it more maybe pragmatic or is the question is, do we, do we need as a human do we need as a human experience so for example do we need suffering in order to understand and to experience there is there is no suffering so do we need to go through all this you know do we need this human experience to go you know what i'm saying like what i'm pointing to mm -hmm. because if we don't if i wouldn't know suffering then i wouldn't know what is non-suffering and everything or so because you could potentially you could say like whatever just we don't even know, go need to go through these 10 steps and you know because whatever it's you know concepts and just surrender but i think we need to go through these things in order to surrender so there is this the path is valid and important in order to understand there is no path to go right we need 
we need to go the, the path in order to understand there's no path to go. I think this is for me as a human, in my human experience and why I'm listening to these talks and going to satsang and being with all you beautiful people. Yeah, I think this is for me the, the you know, kind of essential and important, yeah. Yeah, of course, Connie. I mean, there's a lot of teachings about the unique, the unique position of the human. And I actually, I, I'd like to share this. It's sort of a, a little flip, a little twist on Buddhist cosmology. So in, cla in the classic Buddhist cosmology is, of course, these six paths of rebirth, hell dweller, hungry ghost, and animal, the little Goldilocks zone of existence called being a human being, and then these uh, demigods called asuras, and then devas, or just full-on gods. Those are the six possibilities, of course, with all this uh, spe specialization in between. And there is a kind of a general understanding in Buddhism and kind of a lot of Indian, Indian traditions that being a human's unique and a kind of a rare opportunity. In Buddhism, what they teach is basically being in hell or being a ghost, a hungry ghost at that, and even being an animal are so kind of like survival. It's like so raw survival oriented that, you know, as you're an animal, you're just like, whoa, you're just like looking out to get through the next meal to get through the next day kind of a thing. Hungry ghosts and hell dwellers, it's even worse. And so they're kind of in a bad situation. Yeah, karmically speaking, but they're also kind of in a bad situation where they can't really appreciate these teachings. But be, not because of maybe a capacity or a faculty, but just because of their life situation kind of a thing. The flip side of it is, is that the gods and the demigods, they actually get everything they want all the time. So they never experience what we experience as suffering. So the, there's teachings of the Buddha where the human being is kind of the only being that sort of has an equal foot in pleasure and pain, that they could appreciate the wisdom of uh, trying to avoid both. Most creatures are trying to maximize pleasure and minimize pain. It is a, the enlightened being that is actually sort of keeps both of those at bay, so to speak, upectically speaking, equanimously speaking. So what that means, Connie, is that from a Buddhist cosmological point of view, like there's kind of this evolution chain or whatever, and human beings are right in the middle. That's fine, that's fine, that's like classic. I, I gotta respect classic cosmology and all of that, but I'd like to just share with you a different way of thinking about it that's much more in line with this teaching. And that is, well, if we're thinking lakshanically, which we've been thinking lakshanically all night, so let's keep doing it. If you think lakshanically about a human being, yeah, there's one way of describing a human as, you know, opposable thumb, upright, like whatever, whatever, which is the positive positing sense of it. A human being is upright, opposable thumb, yada, yada, yada. But there's another way, and this doesn't just go for species, it goes for anything, but there's another way to describe lakshanically what a human is. Not a dog, not a cat, not a bird, not a dinosaur, not all of those other creatures, maybe mammal, maybe not, may, not all of those, therefore human. The subtle message there, the idea of defining something by what it's not, rather than what you think it might be, right? If you followed me on that, sorry for that long-winded cosmological digression, but if you followed me on that I flip of it, where 
it's not that the human being is evolutionary in this chain, but what I think a human being is at all is that which is not total animal hell dweller and not God, but in between, so to speak, I guess what I'm trying to say is, is that maybe what a human being is, is well, maybe it is a homo sapien, uh, an aware being, but it's not aware of oneself. It means aware of suffering. Maybe that's what a human being is. And then, and, and then when one is suffering in that unique way where there's an awareness of it, it looks like this with opposable thumbs. That that's what the cognizant aware sufferer looks like. Just putting that out there as a subtle idea, Connie, to your comment. I answered it in a classic Buddhist way, but I also wanted to take it a little further. But, but Mike, to your yeah, yeah, yeah. but dear, to your example, I was under assumption um, that the human state um, is, I don't want to like call it superior because it's like, I don't like the superior, but that it, that it is superior as being a God. You know, there are so many texts of like the chance that you get into human like state or experience is a turtle swims once in a lifetime, every other culprit and catches the fish, you know, it's like never. So I think we are in, com because compared to gods, we are in the superior state because we have the capacity of inquiry and, and self, -re 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 uh, you know, what, what you just mentioned. So absolutely connie absolutely i think i actually think i got kind of off track absolutely i guess what that's what i was sort of wanted to express was and yes let us not use the language of superior and inferior let's not use that language but let's sort of recognize a certain kind of uniqueness shall we say the uniqueness to the human experience which from a Buddhist point of view is characterized or qualified by an awareness of suffering. And not that other beings aren't aware of suffering, but the idea of the Dharma is that we are the unique being that could sort of, um, well, understand the Dharma, frankly. Um, under, like, you know, understand the noble truth of the relationship between attachment and suffering. You know, if, if you, you, you know, if a dog really wants their squeaky toy, no amount of reasoning with them will probably keep them from wanting it. <laughs> you could explain to them till you're blue in the face that it's causing them frustration and anxiety. You know, like let's say their squeaky toy is on the other side of a piece of glass and they can't get it, but they want it. And so they're just like, <laughs> and they're bumping their head up against it. The idea is, is like a, an animal will, they'll probably give up because they get tired, but will they realize that they're causing themselves suffering? Maybe, maybe not. And if they do, then maybe they're not a dog. But the idea is a God can like manifest it. They can just reach through the, 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 the glass or whatever. So they have no problem. They don't get frustrated. The human being is this animal that gets frustrated, but is capable of being smart enough to recognizing why they're being frustrated. And then vis-a-vis -vis the noble truths realize, oh, I don't have to do that. <laughs> I, I want to do that. I'm programmed and conditioned to do that, but I don't have to. That's the idea. Yeah. That's the idea. Those like, are the, Oh yeah, Brendan. Yo. Oh, um. Uh. I was just thinking, I, I, you know, demigods or gods or whatever. I don't know. I mean, like, you know, was Prince a god? I don't know. I mean, I don't know any gods other than you know the human beings that seem pretty badass. Um. But 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 
sort of connecting to this, but what, when you started talking about uh, your explanation, which was good, I, I, I got to thinking like, we're the only creatures that uh, have this notion of that things could be any other way than they are in that moment. And, you know, and that being sort of the heart of, uh, of the teachings and everything, like, you know, uh, it's, I don't think that's indoctrinated in, in us. Like it's something about, <laughs> um, yeah, the separation of consciousness from the other beings, you know, that, that then creates the whole round of suffering. So, uh, but you know, I don't know, to me, that's like, at least <laughs> it seems like it, it's at the root of it. Uh, you know, that things are a certain way, like you're talking about, uh, Lakshanically is deeply subjective, only subjective, and um, yeah, and things could that things could be any other way than than they are, uh, you know, presently. So, anyways, I don't know. That, that's that's what I got. I assume head. you. I assume you're speaking of the for, artist formerly known as Prince. Yeah. I was. I was indeed a god. Yeah. And and what and actually on that note, I, I would like to point out the difference between Asuras, the demigods, and the Deva gods. This is just interesting in light of tonight's conversation. Asuras or demigods, you could really imagine, and I'm of the opinion that they might actually be talking about this. An Asura or a demigod is like, you know, Jeff Bezos. Someone who's uh, frustration, anxiety, suffering, and I just point, you know, these people out because they are in the terms of, you know, they are known to have a lot of money or whatever. So I don't know how he actually spends his time, but the idea that you could placate your anxieties and stresses just by feeding it with more pleasures and more, oh, more vacations, more yachts, more boats, more this, and that you could actually probably ride it all the way to the grave if you had enough money, power, and influence that you would never have to own up to your actual suffering. You could probably skate all the way through this. Now you would probably have such a bad um, chemical dependency by the time you were done that it probably wouldn't have been worth it. But there is this way in which the reason why the Dharma falls on deaf ears in terms of the demigods is because they think, no, nah, no, nah, I got this, I got this. The devas, though, the real gods, they're not just buying their way out of it. They're actually manifesting whatever they want. And so they live for eons and keep manifesting whatever they want. And so they never experience loss. Human beings, the Buddha says, are sort of, again, special because we, because we suffer. And so to go way back to Connie's initial comment, the idea is it's the fact that we suffer the unique way that we do, that it propels us towards nirvana or enlightenment or liberation. So you can do it. All right, folks, we get it. That's part two of Manjush. And this. This is just the beginning because now we know what we're talking about. <laughs> this was just so we knew what we were going to be talking about. <laughs> so I hope you tune in next time for part three. Like I said, this is probably going to be a long series. Um, so who knows? <laughs> thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Michael. Uh, thank you. I so appreciate seeing you all. I'm happy to see you all. Hope you're all doing well. We got this, by the way. If you forgot, if you forgot, we've got this. We can do this. <sighs> Don't forget. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Um, on, on that note of we got this, um, I, I would just urge you guys, I, Please donate to the collective. Um, your your Donna is split between Michael and the collective. Uh, we're saving up so that we can reopen 
in a physical space when the time is right. So right now the collective is a place and not a place. And here we are on the internet. Um, so please practice Donna for the collective for the Sangha and for Michael. And um, if you haven't registered for Tuesday yet, uh, on Tuesday, Michael is closing out our 10 week wise action series. Um, so we've been running this um, series asking how do we as meditators meet this moment in time. When we started, there were a series of crises happening. Now there are more of them. Um, so the <laughs> last 10 weeks have been very fruitful in that regard. And um, Michael's going to go through Tishnat Han's 14 Principles of Engaged Buddhism uh, on Tuesday to round out the series. So if you if you somehow haven't registered for that yet, the link's in the chat. We're doing it on Eventbrite um, so that we have people register. So you do have to register. Um, so if you haven't done that yet, click on that link and register. And then in the spirit of um, kind of generosity and sharing this practice with others, I would recommend if you haven't yet this week, bring a friend to a sit or recommend a sit to a friend. Um, the last six months have been kind of intense and the next three to six months have the potential to also be kind of intense and luckily we all have a practice. Um, but if you have a friend or a relative who I started bringing my brother to um, Andrea's sitting in place in the morning, which is nice. It's like a 15 minute sit with a Q&A. So my brother doesn't really sit that much. So now he sits for 15 minutes in the morning. Um, that's a very friendly sit to bring people to. And so just, if you have someone in your life who could benefit from a practice and would like to do it, bring them to a sit this week or next week and just kind of uh, check it out together. It's gonna be good for us all in November to have practicing friends. And with that, thank you, Michael. Thank you, everyone. It's good to see you all. And we'll see you on Tuesday. Thanks, everybody. Okay. <clears throat> have a great night. Good night. <laughs> Michael.